I downloaded Tinder because I was really bored and honestly I was quite lonely. This was just last year when the whole COVID thing finally started to die down a little bit. I had actually used Tinder once before this and I've met some pretty decent people off the app. Nothing special though, nor out of the ordinary. But the last time I used Tinder and the last time I'll ever use a dating app again, I met this blonde girl named Haley. She seemed okay at first, hence why I met up with her in the first place. I thought she was cute and I just really wanted someone to connect with. We seemed to really hit it off so that's when we decided we should meet up. Let me just tell you now that shit hit the fan and got absolutely crazy. You hear horror stories all the time about people meeting up with strangers from the internet that you never really seem to pay much attention to. Because, well, you think that things like this don't happen often, and the likelihood of it happening to you is slim to none. Well, that's how I thought anyways. I figured we would just go out to eat or maybe catch a movie or something, but she wanted to come to my house instead. As a matter of fact, she insisted. I made up an excuse as to why we couldn't hang out at my place. Really, it was because my house was a mess, and also I just wanted to get out of the house myself anyways. She very bluntly explained to me that we couldn't hang out unless we were to hang out at my house. Look, I know I should have saw this as a red flag, and I think part of me did, but I didn't pay enough attention to it. She was really pretty, and I was lonely. I think she definitely used that to her advantage, because she knew it too. I eventually caved in, and I told her that she could come over. So we set up a time for her to come, and that gave me just enough time to clean the house, and to shower, and get myself ready. She texted me when she got here, and I let her in. It was extremely awkward at first, and right away I thought that she looked a little different from the picture she had on her Tinder account. I couldn't tell if I was just overthinking or not, and I didn't say anything at first about it because I didn't want to be rude. I'm not all that attractive anyway, so I just kind of let it go, and we started chatting. Things were going okay, and then she asked me if I had anything to drink, alcohol-wise. And I told her I had about a half-fifth of Jameson left in the cupboard. I excused myself to the restroom, and when I came back, she was sitting on the couch with her drink in her hand. And I saw that she had prepared a drink for me as well that was sitting on my glass coffee table. I really wasn't in the mood for alcohol, especially not liquor, so I grabbed a beer out of my fridge and drank that instead. About three or four beers later, I ended up drinking my mixed drink that she kept pressuring me to drink. In fact, I almost completely decided against drinking it just because of how bad she wanted me to. I had a paranoid OCD-like thought that it was certainly possible that she could have spiked my drink of something while I was using the bathroom, and I had a serious feeling to stay away from the drink she made me altogether. But I let it go eventually because the drunker I got, the more I realized how delusional I sounded to myself. She seemed like a nice girl and we were getting along just fine. Plus, it didn't seem like there was anything in my drink, so I figured it was okay. Anyways, I drank it, and I didn't feel much different until maybe about 10 or 20 minutes afterwards. But I just played it off as me being drunk and overthinking. After all, I am a lightweight, and six drinks is way more than enough to keep me pretty messed up. This is where things start to get really weird. The last thing I remember was we were sitting on the couch, and I started feeling very strange. I started to feel fainty and very dizzy until I ultimately passed out completely. I had to have been out cold for at least five hours because I woke up at the ass crack of dawn and what I discovered was nothing short of a nightmare. I was lying on my bedroom floor and I awoke in a terrified state of mind. I slowly started to piece together that something was horribly wrong and I was still feeling weird from the drugs she had roofied me with. First thing I noticed was that my whole entire body was in serious pain. All the way from my neck, to my arms, and my back, and my stomach too. I had bruises all over me, and I had over five serious stab-like puncture wounds, along with deep cuts in both of my arms and my stomach. I got up and I saw that my bed and that the floor in my room was soaked with blood, and the walls as well. I about fainted again when I saw this and I remember feeling like I couldn't breathe. I went to grab my phone to call the police but I couldn't find it. it. Turned out that she had stole my phone and all four of my TVs that were in my house. 
along with some jewelry and some of my safes that had over $20,000 in it. I looked all around my house, but nobody was in sight. My house was a complete wreck though, as she destroyed windows, vandalized just about every room, and I mean she just completely demolished everything. I remember looking in the mirror at one point and having a complete breakdown. I couldn't believe that any of this was real. I'm almost 100% positive that there was somebody else other than the girl that I met that was in on this. It's hard for me to even type this out, but my stomach had a really disturbing wound in which they used my blood to draw a pentagram on the wall of my bedroom with. I found one of my old phones in my dresser and I plugged it into the charger and I connected it to the Wi-Fi so I could call a friend on FaceTime audio so they could get the cops out to my house and I just waited for them to show up. It was probably about 20 minutes, if that. I don't know what the hell she drugged me with exactly, but it was reported as some sort of rare, extremely powerful tranquilizer. I gave all the information I could to the police, and I logged into my Tinder account on my old phone in hopes that the account would still be there so I could show the police, but of course, they unmatched me and probably deleted the account. Not that it would have helped much anyways, because I'm pretty sure I was catfished. They never caught the people who did this. I actually moved to a new house a couple of months back, and I don't live in as much fear now. I also have security cameras, and I have an ADT security alarm system set up now too, which I recommend everybody has if possible. It could save your life. I grew up in Ohio in the 70s, and me and my childhood friend Joe were outside all the time we could manage it. Joe lived on a farm that bordered a pretty big forest and my parents would drop me off in the morning and we'd stay in the woods all weekend. We'd only come out for school. We loved pretending that we were frontiersmen. We'd build shelters, traps, practice making fire with sticks, the whole nine yards. By now we were in high school. One day we decided we'd walk the railroad tracks out in the country. We were exploring and trying to find cool bridges to fish from and camp a little ways off the tracks. Of course we knew this was dangerous and we'd likely be trespassing, but we were kids. We had a lot of fun. We did find beautiful rivers and even discovered bridges no one went to. We fished, we hid from trains, and at night we camped in the woods just near the tracks and made small hidden fires. Nothing bad ever happened. It was idyllic, in fact it was so fun we did it multiple times. Never had a problem. After high school, me and Joe went on our own ways. We both left home but always stayed in touch and always tried to coordinate visits so we'd see each other occasionally. Well, one summer in the mid 90s, it worked out that we were both in town for about a week. We'd do stuff with family in the day and at night we'd either catch drinks at a bar or sit outside Joe's house around a fire and talk about the old days. One night, me and Joe got to talking about our old trips. Well, nostalgia and beer are a hell of a mix, so... Soon we decided to take a day to walk the trails and camp one night and then walk home. The day finally came and we started out early in the morning. We had my wife drop us off in our old spot where we used to start, right outside of our hometown. She thought this was an absolutely crazy idea and made sure to mention it. When she pulled away, Joe suggested that instead of walking the usual route, we take the opposite direction just to be adventurous. We knew the land well, I mean we had a map, so I gave a what the hell and off we set. The day went fine. It was fun, and a little sad even, but in a good way. We found a bridge and sat on the edge, smoked a joint and moved on. We had no fishing gear, but we brought some canned food and other stuff. Before night started to settle in, we picked a spot to camp. It was a thick forested area, trees on every side of the train tracks, so you felt like you were in a tunnel. We had bought small hammocks to sleep on, but before we set them up, we decided to do a little scouting of the perimeter. Now this is what we used to do in the old days too. We'd walk the area around a little bit to make sure some dude's house wasn't just over a hill or something and we were actually camping in their yard. We walked maybe a hundred or so feet into the woods and up a small incline. We figured if we didn't see anything from the top of this short hill, we'd be fine. But when we got to the top, we saw an old building down at the bottom, about a hundred yards into the woods. It was barely visible. We pondered over what to do. We both assumed it was a sugar shack or something, because there didn't appear to be a clear road into it. From where we were, there didn't look to be anyone in it either. All was quiet. No movement could be seen. 
No lights. We decided to walk a little closer just to make sure. We came down the hill very slowly and as we neared the building, we saw it wasn't a sugar shack at all. It was an old church. It looked like it had been abandoned for years. It was a small, sagging building whose wooden planks were almost black from years of moss and rot. A cross still stood on top of the place and was also weathered black. None of the windows had glass and there were no doors, just open doorways. We got close enough to see inside and there were rows of pews and a built-up section in front for a preacher to stand. We didn't go all the way in, we didn't want to. Beyond all that, there was no sign of anyone else. No footprints, no paths. It was an abandoned church. We left immediately and we went back up the hill to our spot we had picked for camp. Having a hill between us and the church made us feel better, but we were still a little uneasy. We chalked it up to be the natural creepiness seeing a church in the middle of the woods would elicit. Besides, at this point it was dusk and we just decided to rig up our hammocks and go to sleep and move on at early morning. Night set in and as we lay in our hammocks and shot the shit, we began to hear something in the direction of the church. Our conversation about it went a little like this. Do you hear that? What the hell is that? It sounds like people singing. And it did sound just like singing. We both slid right out of our hammocks and hunkered down, straining to hear more. We listened for a minute or two and the singing continued, but it wasn't getting louder. Finally, we decided to creep back up the hill and see if we could spy where the sound was coming from. We could still move very quietly in the woods from the old days. It was second nature to us. The moon was barely out, but it provided enough light so you wouldn't walk right into a tree, but it was near pitch black. We didn't use flashlights as we crept slowly up the hill and we didn't talk. When we got to the top, we saw light in the distance. It was coming from the church, and the singing was coming from inside. Joe and I put our heads close together and had a hushed conversation that boiled down to, Can you believe this shit? The light looked to be candlelight from the way it flickered, and though we tried, we couldn't make out what was being sung. It sounded like church music, but maybe in another language. We sat and watched for a while, trying to see who was in there, but we only saw occasional shadows. We had no intention of getting closer either. We had about a football field length between us, and we aimed to keep it that way. The singing continued for a bit, and then it stopped. After that, a booming male voice began to chant. I was already freaked out, but this voice thoroughly scared the shit out of me. It sounded like some Old Testament preacher you see in movies, but again, it was like he was speaking in a different language because we couldn't understand a single word. Eventually, it got to where the single male voice would say something and then a bunch of voices would answer in song. This lasted for a while and then they all broke into this long sustained wail that just kept getting louder. It got so loud and so disturbing that I covered my ears. Then it stopped. At this point, I was getting ready to say, let's just get the heck out of here, when Joe put a hand on my shoulder and hissed. They're coming out. We were far enough away that we couldn't make them out very well, but what we could see was a line of figures walking out the open doorway, all holding hands in single file. We could see some of them had flashlights. They began to sing again, and the light from the flashlights began to move toward us and the hill. We booked it back down to our campsite, grabbed our shit and ran to the tracks. Once there, we ran to the tracks in the direction we had come from. After a few minutes, we stopped and looked back, and we saw lights coming down the hill. They were moving erratically, like whoever was holding them was shaking them. We continued to run in spurts and walk as fast as we could. We eventually stopped seeing the lights and we came to a road. By our map, we knew a small town was about 15 minutes down it, and we walked there got to a 24-hour gas station and called my wife to come get us. My wife and other friends all thought it was kids messing around, but I heard those voices and they sure as hell didn't sound like kids to me. Not sure who those people were, but it was definitely the creepiest thing that happened to me out in the woods. I made one of the most idiotic decisions I have ever made a few years back that ultimately led me straight to a downright horrible and absolutely barbaric situation. With someone that I presume is honestly a serial killer, or even worse potentially. I'm a 21 year old girl and this took place about 3 years ago to be exact. I was 18 at the time and I had just graduated high school. 
It was the middle of August, and it was a relatively boring day. Up until this point, my summer vacation was extremely boring. My dad and I lived alone, and he was extremely protective of me. So much that he was abusive to me emotionally and psychologically. He wouldn't let me have any friends whatsoever. And every day I had to stay home to either help him with chores around the house, or pretty much to be his personal slave. He even took my bedroom door off the hinges to make me feel completely powerless. He never let me have an ounce of privacy, until he finally got me a phone that is, which was about a month before this all took place. He would usually take my phone at 8 o'clock every night, but he was extremely drunk this night and he didn't get home from the bar until after 10 o'clock or so. I guess he forgot. Either that or he thought I was asleep so he didn't bother. I'm not sure. Probably a mixture of both. I had Tinder on my phone and I used that <laughs> as an escape to meet new people and to socialize. Through all my years of isolation, I was never really able to meet any good friends. Most of the kids at my school either pretended to be my friend, or just flat out picked on me and did their best to make my life a living hell. I had been talking to this guy who, we'll call Alex for this story, on Tinder for just over a day and our friendship <laughs> progressed pretty quick. I had to be careful though because my dad would snoop through everything in my phone so I had to delete anything on it that my dad would not be okay with every night before giving him my phone, which 100% included Tinder. He would have killed me if he knew I was on there. Anyways, this guy I was talking to was 28 years old, and at the time, him being much older attracted me and it boosted my confidence that an older man was talking to me. But looking back, even just a few years ago, I can see how it was definitely kind of creepy of him to be talking to someone my age. Anyways, I sort of told him about my situation at home, and he said that I could come live with him. He reminded me that I'm an adult now and legally I don't have to abide by my father anymore. I was extremely excited by this but also terrified. He told me that he could pick me up tonight and that I should get my things ready. I told him that I really wasn't ready for that yet and that I just wanted to hang out for now and I asked him if that was okay, to which he agreed. He told me he would be there to pick me up at midnight and I said okay. I told him that I needed to be back home by 4am and he said that was okay too. I also told him not to drive down my driveway and to just park on the side of the road and to text me when he's here and that I'll just come out. My dad's house had kind of a long driveway and I was scared that my dad would somehow hear him pulling up and wake up, so I figured him parking further away would be much safer for us. He then told me that he preferred to talk over text and so he asked me for my number. I gave it to him, but I told him that on any other normal night, unless prompted otherwise, to not text me after 8 o'clock. He already knew about my dad, so he agreed. Sure enough, Alex showed up like 5 minutes past 12 o'clock, and he texted me to let me know he was outside like I asked him to. I texted him back and said that I'll be out in just a few minutes. I snuck out of my window and I started making my way down the driveway and I didn't see any sign of Alex. Like I said before, my dad has a decently long sized driveway and each side has a bunch of trees that outline the entirety of the driveway, all the way down to the end of the road by the mailbox. I thought it was weird because I figured I would see a light coming from his car or something, but I think I just figured he had his car turned off to be more low key and less suspicious since he knew about my dad. As I was walking down the driveway, I was probably about halfway to the road, I started to hear some whispering. I sat there for a moment just observing, and then I heard a man burst out in laughter, then quiet down really quickly again, and then the whispering continued. I started walking again, ever so softly, and I made it within probably 20 feet of who I thought to be was Alex, and I could finally start to hear what was being said. I came to the conclusion that he was on the phone because he was having a conversation, but nobody was speaking back from what I could hear. Now, I can admit I was eavesdropping, and this isn't something I would normally do, but given the circumstances of the situation, I'm pretty sure you could understand why I had my guard up so high. And I'm extremely glad I did, because I would probably be dead right now if I hadn't. And that's when I heard the most sickening and disturbing thing I've ever heard in my entire life. He began bragging to whoever he was on the phone with about how he was waiting for me and how he was going to rape the shit out of me, and I quote, keep me alive for as long as possible. 
I literally almost puked when I heard this, and I made a bit of ruckus apparently, because right after, Alex seemingly became eerily and abruptly quiet. I thought about running back inside, but I thought I had a better chance of just hiding. I ran back in the direction I came from, towards the house, and I took a hard right into the woods, and I hid in this spot that I knew about. I figured I would be safe for now. About five minutes had passed, and not a single noise came about. Then I got a text. It was from Alex. Where are you? He asked. I obviously ignored it, and then I turned my ringer off. He then began blowing my phone up with messages and calls until I finally picked up after probably the fifth time of him calling me. I thought it would be a much better idea to answer the phone and to come up with a lie and make an excuse about how I can't come tonight and how I'm really sorry and that we should hang out another time. He didn't buy it though. I think he knew I was on to him. He started getting extremely angry with me and tried to make me feel bad by telling me I wasted his time and that's when his true colors came out. He started cussing me out and telling me about how horrible I am and how no guy will ever love me and that sort of thing. And then he said something that truly frightened me to my core. I know where you live, just remember that. I hope you sleep tight, honey. I'll see you soon. And then he hung up. Almost right after that, I heard a car turn on and speed off, and that was thankfully the last time I heard from him. I really wanted to keep the peace because he knew where I lived and I was just hoping he would stay away after this. I lied awake all night in bed wondering if he was going to come back or not and I was terrified he was going to kill me. I blocked him on Tinder and from my phone number as well and I called my grandma the very next morning while my dad was at work and I told her what happened. I completely confided in her about my dad and told her about how horrible he had been to me my whole life. She came and picked me up, and we didn't tell my dad anything at all about what happened. My grandma always knew my dad was horrible, but she never knew truly just how bad he was to me at home. I was too scared to tell anyone about it for the longest of time, but it was truly the best decision I've ever made. I've since been much happier, and I'm working on getting my own place with my girlfriend. Life has been moving along, and I've been healing and getting better each day. I tried to contact the police, but they told me they couldn't do anything without any proof, so I knew I was screwed. It's more than likely that Alex is still out there hurting others, if that's even his real name. When I was in college, I pondered the idea of trying out some dating apps like Bumble and Tinder for no reason other than to meet new people and to cure some of my own boredom. I matched with someone I recognized from high school named Claire. We spoke very little about anything really, we only briefly talked about how it was a coincidence that we never spoke before. We had the same group of friends in high school, and our school was relatively small, so I suppose it was kind of weird that we barely knew each other. Conversation very quickly turned into her asking me if I wanted to hang out that night. I was stoked, so of course I said yes, all while trying not to sound overly excited about it. You know, I kind of thought that it was weird that she wanted to hang out so quickly, especially at night. But I hardly questioned it, and I didn't want to ruin my chances. She asked me to come over and told me I could come by anytime after 11 o'clock. She told me that she would be alone and that I should try to bring weed if I could. I didn't smoke, but I knew friends that did, so I showed up with $10 worth of some pretty shitty looking weed, hoping that it would be good enough for her. Looking back, I should have been more wary, and I at least should have told someone I was close with where I was going, because little did I know, I was in for an extremely messed up situation. But my 20-year-old curious virgin brain ran rapid with the endless possibilities of me having a lucky night. I think I kind of liked the idea of not knowing what was going to happen, but I never would have thought in a million years that what happened would happen. On my way there, I was excited and I turned on some music and I was singing in my car practically the whole way there. As I started to get closer, probably only two minutes away, I started to get a weird feeling as I didn't really recognize the area and that's when my anxiety kicked in a little bit. When I pulled into the neighborhood, I saw that it was a very rundown area and I started to question if I was in the wrong location. But the address she gave me matched up with where I was, so I continued driving until I stumbled upon her house. I felt my heart drop to my stomach when I saw the house that she gave me the address to. I'm telling you right now, I knew deep down for a fact that something wasn't right. 
There was something so off about the house and area I was in, in general. The house was extremely dark, and the only light coming from it was an inside light that was upstairs. I rolled down my foggy tinted window so I could get a better view, and I told myself there was no way I was going to walk up to the house. It literally looked abandoned. I started to drive away, and less than a minute later I received a notification on Tinder from Claire that asked where I was going, and to come back. I told her I thought I had the wrong house, and she told me I was wrong about my presumption, and she told me to come back once again. I seriously didn't want to, and I had a horrible feeling about it, but I also wanted it to not be a setup so bad that I foolishly went back. I asked her if she would come outside when I get there, and she called me a wimp and told me that she was just finishing up getting ready and that the door was unlocked and that I can just let myself in. Still to this day, I'm embarrassed by how stupid it was of me to actually follow through with what she said, but I did. I parked the car on the side of the road and I began walking up to the porch. I knocked on the door to let myself be known and I opened it. I walked in slowly and right away I could tell that the house was disgusting. It was extremely dark but from what I could see it was a mess and really vile looking. I heard some music coming from upstairs and I saw a light up there as well so I followed it. Hello? Claire, I'm here, I said. The closer I got the more I could make out the music. There was some sort of death metal or black metal music playing which really freaked me out honestly even more just added to the creepy and eerie vibe of everything. I finally made it up the stairs and I saw there was only two rooms, one of which was the bathroom that had the light off and I looked in there and there was nobody. I then pointed my direction at the other door where the music was coming from, but it didn't really look like the bedroom had a light on or anything inside. That's when my anxiety turned to fear and I really began questioning my choices of how I wound up in this situation. Then the music stopped. I heard a bunch of footsteps walking around on the hardwood tile before me in the room and people were talking. And then I heard a loud scream come from the bedroom that jump scared me so bad I almost fell down the stairs. Finally, my senses hit me and I realized it was time to leave and how dangerous of a situation I was in. I turned around to run down the stairs and that's when I saw some guy dressed in black that had gothic makeup on and long dark hair. Almost simultaneously, the door behind me upstairs also opened. Ethan, hey, it's Claire. I'm glad you could make it, she said. I turned around and I saw that it definitely wasn't Claire from school and that I was 100% being catfished. Then the guy downstairs started walking quickly up the stairs in my direction. Okay guys, this isn't funny anymore. Please just leave me alone. And they both started laughing and started calling me names. <laughs> I knew my only option was to fight or to run, so I thought running would be the first best option. I ran into the bathroom and I managed to shut and lock the door before they could get to me. They both started banging on the door and twisting the doorknob profusely, extremely hard, and told me to let them in. I looked all around for something I could use to act as a weapon, and the next best thing I could find was a toothbrush. I knew that wasn't going to help much, but I figured it was better than nothing. I could stab them in the neck or the eye with it if I really had to, and it came down to it. I started panicking even more when I fully realized the severity of the situation I was in. I opened the shower curtain and I saw there was a window that looked pretty small, but I had to try my luck. It was pretty much my only option at this point. I opened the window and I managed to fit through it, and just as I landed on the roof I almost slipped and fell to the ground. Luckily I didn't though, and I caught myself. I made my way around the house while still on the roof as I was looking for the safest way down and I managed to find a trampoline in the backyard that I could jump on to get the hell out of there. I ran like hell all the way to my car and there wasn't a sign of either of them. They didn't chase me down or anything. I drove away and I called the cops and gave them all the information I had to give. I told them I was driving home and I gave them the address of the place and the police later stopped by my house that night to tell me what they discovered and so I could make a better statement. Apparently, the people who were setting me up were a group of people in some sort of black metal band that killed innocent people by luring them off of dating apps like Tinder by using a pretty girl as a catfish. In the house, which was abandoned by the way, the police discovered two dead bodies of two girls that were my age and tons and tons of blood. 
I think the police actually caught two of the murder suspects, but are still looking for the rest of them, and apparently the group called themselves Holy Eternity or something like that. These people are really messed up, and I was almost murdered that night. I've never touched a dating app since, and I don't think I ever will. So I own this property in the countryside of Alabama. It's in the middle of nowhere with 60 plus acres. It has an abandoned house, barn, and greenhouse. The barn and house are close to each other and the greenhouse is far into the woods. Me and my friend were setting up our film equipment in the house because we were going to film a video the next day. My friend wakes up and tells me he's getting really weird feelings about all of this, so we go to sleep in my truck. I fall asleep when we get in the truck and my friend is still awake. He told me it was around 4 in the morning and he saw 7 to 8 people in hoods and ropes. He said they looked around the house for a bit, probably to see if anyone was there because they saw our equipment in my truck. One of the guys stared directly at my friend in the car, but my windows are tinted, so the guy had a hard time seeing my friend. The guy stops investigating my truck and goes back with the group. My friend tried to wake me up, but I wouldn't. The morning came and my friend was still very sleepy from not catching sleep, and we went into the house to check on everything. The lights are smashed, papers are burned, umbrellas are broken. We found candles around the house and a cat nailed to a wall with a pentagram around it. We found decayed animals, two dogs, some horses, some cattle, birds, a bat, and some kind of hand buried. Since this place was once farmland, I just assumed the previous owners just left the animals to die or something, but I didn't know how to explain the bat, birds, and hand. This stuff was found near the barn and in the barn. So one day, we come back to see if there's any more weird shit going on, and we find three pigs on crosses near the house. The pigs were decapitated and the heads were on the ground in front of them. They were wearing makeup and they had wigs sewn into their heads. My friend tells me he thinks the people he saw the last time we were there did it. And he was telling me he thought they might be a satanic cult or some weird group. Around the crosses and pigs, some parts of the ground was burned. A few large circles. We spent the rest of our day taking down the pigs and burying them in the woods. We go here again to ride some dirt bikes and ATVs, and nothing weird was there when we came. We put them in the barn because we would come back later in the week. My friend's putting up his ATV and tells me he saw a person in the barn, just relaxing on some hay. But it was in the dark, in one of those horses or cattle stalls. My friend stood there for a while to see if it was a person, and the man moved his hand in a goodbye kind of way. My friend runs out of the barn and tells me what happens. I go in there because I thought my friend was just bullshitting me, but no one was in there. Then when I'm leaving the barn, I see the guy trying to sleep on the second story, and I ask if he's alright, and he tells me he is, and to just go away and let him sleep. Even though it's my property, I didn't want to start any shit with him, so I let him be. We end up thinking that he is part of the group that's been doing stuff on my property. We go there again about two weeks later, and we see from my truck the guy walking out of the barn and talking to two guys. One of them point to my truck and they all run into the woods. I get my knife and gun. I keep it under my seat. And finally, it came in use. We then go to the guys to tell them that they can't come here anymore and that it's my property. I can't find them, but we found that most of them stay inside the greenhouse. We found clothes, books, and dead birds and squirrels. And I'm assuming that's what they ate. There was a pond nearby, so that's probably what they bathed in. Or maybe they didn't bathe at all. We go to the barn to investigate some more, and we found books on the second story, an altar, and some tall candles. All of this was out of sight from the ground. We also found stuff like rope, knives, nails, a hammer, and a mallet. We conclude that all of those guys there are in the group, and they did all this weird shit. We have not been on that property for months now, so we don't know if they're still there or moved on. The police have searched there before for two guys that kidnapped a nine-year-old too so those guys might be blamed for that. The police found no one though. 